Hello and welcome back. I hope uh, you had the opportunity to have a good lunch. We're going to move to the uh, next session. And for that purpose, I would like to invite Dr. Thomas Brothers, one of our vascular surgeons, who is one of the editors of the Journal of Vascular Surgery. I gave him uh, a challenging task. I asked him to uh, present what he considered were the best papers published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery during the year 2013. So, Tom, please. Must have been a good lunch, must still be a good lunch, <laughs> or else there, uh, there's a special in, on drinks. So, anyway, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be here this morning, but it sounds like it was quite a spirited discussion and it uh, would have been a lot of uh, fun to be here. So, uh, first of all, a couple of disclosures. Uh, I am an associate editor, not a full editor, uh, which means that uh, Tony and Bruce really kind of tell me what to do and what I'm doing wrong, and that's easy, um, because there's a lot of that. Um, I am compensated for that, although I would say very lightly, very lightly, because it does take about uh, an hour a day to do. Having said that, I'm here in a totally unofficial capacity. I probably am committing some type of, uh, if not felony, at least misdemeanor by going ahead and using the, uh, uh, swiping the, uh, the title here uh, from the website. Uh, um, but uh, since uh, Claudio asked me to sort of represent a little bit uh, that, that I did do that, I did uh, clear it uh, uh, with uh, some of the folks, but I just wanted to let, let you know that this is this is totally unauthorized. It's not sanctioned by anybody. The opinions are entirely my own, and, uh, and uh, that's what I'm going to uh, uh, give you. So how to decide? Um, at first I, th first, I thought it was going to be a little bit easier because Claudia, I got the impression that maybe I could choose maybe the top 10 or the top 15, but uh, the top six uh, is what uh, Claudio asked for, and that's a little bit tougher. And I didn't want to just um, necessarily only show my own bias. So. What did I, I did is I asked um, the publication staff for the list of the top 20 most downloaded as well as the top 20 most cited articles from 2013. Um, and then I preferentially tried to select articles that were on both lists to talk about a little bit. You know, clearly those who, uh, or those articles which were uh, published earlier in the year were biased in favor of appearing on these lists. So the last couple of months, I, I sort of looked uh, on my own, following my own bias. And because, after all, this is the sanctuary of endovascular therapy, and even though uh, probably my greatest love is as an open vascular surgeon, um, I did uh, try to keep it to things that at least had some type of endovascular component to the article. So, th so those are kind of the ground rules. Okay, we'll go through uh, in no uh, particular order. So the first is, uh, was published in February. Endovascular repair of ruptured infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm is associated with lower 30-day mortality and better five-year survival rates than open surgical repair. If I can just step back a little bit, what a great title. You don't even have to read the article. You already know what it's going to talk about. And, and actually, uh, Tony and uh, Bruce really uh, do like to see this, this uh, kind of title uh, for the articles. In any event, it was second overall in downloads uh, from the website and third in the number of citations, um, already uh, six at that time. This comes from the uh, group in Albany. So their question that, that they asked, does endovascular repair of ruptured infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm result in better early and later survival than open repair? And I know Dr. Veith is going to actually give us the real answer to this, but, but I'll talk at least a little bit about uh, what this article talked about. The design of their study was a retrospective case control. It was non-blinded. It was non-randomized. Okay, uh, and the analysis was done on the intention to treat. So, if they started, took somebody to the OR, planning to do an endovascular, but had to open, that would still go under the endovascular category. The setting in which this occurred was a, a single. It's not exactly specified. They don't actually say but it's presumed a university academic vascular surgical uh, group uh, practice up there in Albany. The patients were all patients undergoing intervention for ruptured infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. They did not include the juxtarenal or the suprarenal or the thoracoabdominals. Again, they excluded, so they excluded those. Um, the intervention was comparing either en endovascular aneurysm repair, which uh, we'll 
consider our EVR, or open surgical repair, which is our OSR. Their outcomes of interest, the primary outcome was mortality at 30 days, and then again mortality at five years. The secondary outcomes were a, uh, they performed a uh, logistic regression trying to predict what things might indicate the potential 30-day mortality. Okay, so here initially is their, their uh, table one kind of comparing. Table is organized a little bit strange, but if you look at the, at the top there, they have the EVAR group, and uh, compared to the open surgical group, there's a slightly higher proportion of men than women in the EVAR group, with a slightly smaller aneurysm, although the patients are slightly older although none of these uh, achieve statistical significance. If you look at the other all risk factors, in general, uh, they're pretty similar uh, between the groups. Okay, looking at the cause of death, uh, and this is sort of foreshadows a little bit, you can see there are a lot more deaths on the open surgical side than the endovascular repair side, but in general, the number one cause of death was bleeding or, co or coagulopathy for the open surgical. Uh, followed uh, um, a little bit behind by multi-system organ failure and then an intraoperative myocardial infarction or presumably uh, cardiac arrest on the table. On the other hand, uh, and, and EVAR had a much uh, smaller number. These are numbers, uh, not percentages, uh, but a much smaller number with one exception of abdominal compartment syndrome. That is uh, obviously increased intra-abdominal pressure, probably related to not only failure to evacuate the hematoma, but also perhaps continued bleeding from, uh, um, from type 2 uh, uh, endoleaks. If you look then in a uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, including all those patients uh, from the, the time of, uh, of the initial presentation, you can see relatively clearly uh, that uh, there is a survival advantage in this non-randomized retrospective study to uh, having your aneurysm repaired by a uh, endovascular means. This, uh, and, it, and, and you can really see that, it's, that most of that difference comes within the first, you know, probably the perioperative period, the, the first uh, week or two. If you s remove that first 30 days, there really is not much of any difference. So it's initially, it's early on, uh, uh, and the, the curves otherwise uh, seem to superimpose uh, uh, pretty closely otherwise. If you then look at the causes uh, for mortality um, along the way, uh, you can see that those uh, patients who died, as you might expect, were more likely to uh, have a, a blood loss, et cetera. But interestingly, uh, the, at the top of the slides are really the, uh, the univariate analysis. But if you then put it into, put everything in together to sort of see what shakes out in the multivariate analysis, which is really the most important, you can uh, see that actually on the open surgical, that larger size was associated with higher mortality, while interestingly, interestingly, the presence of coronary disease was protective of mortality. Now, not quite sure what to make of that. The authors uh, surmised this might be in some way related to that perhaps they had known coronary disease, that perhaps they were on beta blockers ahead of time, or they were somehow protected. But this is, uh, you know, one of the hazards of doing any kind of uh, large-scale sort of fishing expedition a little bit. Uh, looking for predictors is that, uh, you know, uh, P less than 0 .05 means at least one out of 20 times you'll, uh, you'll think that there's something significant that really isn't. In any event, on the opposite side, for endovascular, it turns out that increased age was predictive of mortality. The presence of hypertension somehow was protective with a pretty low odds ratio. Uh, and uh, and the presence of, while well, the presence of hyperlipidemia um, was not, was, uh, was predictive of higher mortality. And it's kind of hard to know what to do with all that information. In any event, the, the results I think that you can take away from this is that, there are, that the 30 day difference uh, in mortality for ruptured endovascular uh, uh, aneurysm versus open was actually greater than men, er, in, greater in men. So 21% uh, mortality for uh, endovascular versus 44% for, for open, and that's for men. You didn't see quite as much difference among women, 32 versus 44 percent, and that turned out in their uh, number of patients not to be statistically significant. So among conclusions, and these uh, conclusions are my own from, from their data, I didn't always 
um, accept their conclusions. Among patients presenting with a ruptured infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysms, endovascular repair was associated with a lower 30-day mortality and greater survival at five years than open surgical repair. Now, that doesn't mean that that caused it, but at least in their study, it was associated with a lower mortality. However, there really was no difference in mortality among women. So perhaps with greater numbers of patients, or perhaps not, um, the effect does not seem to be as large uh, with women. Now, obviously, there's an inherent uh, significant selection bias because, it, gets, it was a retrospective study. Presumably, there were reasons why, on the one hand, they chose to do. Uh, it, was, uh, it was based on the, uh, uh, the surgeon's own uh, particular bias and how they preferred to do things. And there was also a temporal bias. Most of the uh, ruptured, uh, or the endovascular repairs, the ruptures were later on in the series when presumably also there may have been improvements in anesthesia and intensive care unit management as well. So you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. Uh, this one uh, also appeared in February. That was, February was a pretty good month, a year ago. This is titled Angiosome Targeted Infrapopteal Endovascular Revascularization for Treatment of Diabetic Foot Ulcers. And this is uh, from the group uh, in uh, Finland, uh, from uh, Helsinki primarily. This was the number three download and number two most citations as of January. So the question they asked is provision of direct compared with indirect infrapopteal endovascular revascularization to the angiosome feeding the ulcer area improve wound healing. So just to remind some of you what an angiosome is because it's a relatively, uh, it may have been adopted or, or uh, proposed a while ago, but relatively newly uh, um, uh, discussed to any great length, that each particular area of the foot be, can be considered to be supplied by a particular artery. Now, unfortunately, um, in Finland, uh, they don't always put the uh, letters in the uh, right order. So when I look at ATP, I'm thinking anterior tibial, but that's actually the posterior tibial artery. But in any event, the uh, medial plantar area on the bottom of the foot is uh, uh, by the medial uh, uh, plantar uh, branch of the posterior tibial, laterally in the bottom of the foot by the lateral plantar artery uh, if you uh, look in the lateral aspect of the heel, it's the perineal. Uh, medial aspect of the heel, though, is, the, uh, is from the uh, posterior tibial artery. And uh, uh, along the top of the foot, over the dorsum, then it's primarily over from the uh, anterior tibial and dorsalis pedis. And then the perineal artery uh, up higher and laterally on the foot. So the idea that you can uh, sort of look at things and so, for example, if you had an ulcer on the top of the foot, uh, the angio, if you can revascularize the, uh, the dorsalis pedis or the anterior tibial, uh, that that question is, will that patient do better? So, their design was a retrospective, case control, non-blinded, non-randomized study. So the setting, uh, again, wasn't really specified, but it's presumed that it was in a university academic vascular surgery group practice, uh, but again, we're not, we're not entirely sure. So the patients they looked at were diabetic patients, so this was restricted to diabetic patients with peripheral arterial disease and foot ulcers who underwent a technically successful, and by that they meant less than 50% residual stenosis, a uh, technically successful primary percutaneous transluminal angioplasty of one of the uh, uh, three infragenoculate uh, arteries, the anterior tibial, perineal, posterior tibial artery, and actually the tibial perineal trunk as well. The intervention was either direct provision of direct flow to the angiosome by endovascular means or uh, by collateral flow or indirect flow to the angiosome. And the primary outcome of interest was the time to ulcer healing. How long did it take? The secondary was the time to ulcer healing after adjustment by propensity scoring. Now, what they mean by that is it was recognized that when they first looked at those patients who had primary direct versus indirect revascularization, that there were a lot of differences between the groups. So they used a statistical uh, tool called propensity analysis to sort of go back and try to even up the teams, even up the, uh, the sides a little bit, and which is a, which is a valid way to uh, do things. So here's their overall series, uh, and again, there's sort of table one, and I'll just highlight a couple things. First of all, um, before the, uh, the adjustment, you saw that the, uh, that the uh, direct group were, patients were younger. They were more likely to be male. 
They were less likely to have coronary disease, all things that uh, would presume to be uh, uh, really uh, advantageous for that group, unfairly so, although they were less likely to have an elevated uh, uh, GFR. Once they did the propensity scoring, however, pretty much all of those differences uh, no longer became uh, statistically uh, significant. Um, and they, when they did the propensity scoring, by the way, you'll note that uh, actually they, uh, they only used about two-thirds of the patients that they uh, started out with. So I guess that's arguable how helpful that is. So in any event, what they found overall in the series, if you look at this, is, is uh, uh, the percent ulcer healing on the, on the y-axis and the months it, it took, you can see that there is a difference, and this turns out to be statistically significant, that inline provision of direct revascularization clearly shows a faster healing time. I would also point out that even at 12 months by doing this, the ulcers, even uh, for the direct angiosome revascularization, there's less than 80% of those ulcers are healed. And uh, somewhere around only half, not even half, of the uh, patients with the indirect were healed. And that's, that's a little bit disconcerting. In any event, the differences remained if, when they only looked at the, the uh, um, propensity matched pairs, uh, which is, you know, uh, I guess good evidence that uh, maybe this is a real finding, that it does seem like uh, things go better when you provide uh, direct revascularization of the angiosome. So really, and then when they did a multivariate uh, analysis, they found that direct revascularization really was the only predictor with an odds ratio of close to two uh, of, uh, of the uh, uh, speed of healing. Interestingly, there were no significant differences in limb salvage. There were some differences, perhaps a type 2 error, but uh, there were, the, those differences were not significant. And in fact, uh, there are no differences in one-year survival and no differences in amputation-free survival at one year, uh, which is um, both of the, uh, all of those uh, just a little bit uh, surprising and disappointing. In any event, the conclusion I think that we can take away from this is that attaining direct arterial flow to the angiosome containing the ulcer is associated with more rapid ulcer healing when providing infrapopteal endovascular revascularization in diabetic patients. Clearly, this study was biased by its retrospective nature, the fact it's non-randomized. And uh, also, uh, unfortunately, they really didn't standardize the wound care. They didn't really describe. And it could be that some of the ulcers started out being a lot bigger than some of the others. And uh, we're kind of left not knowing that. So, so uh, you know, unfortunately, this is really not the end-all, be-all, although it has some, some validity. Okay. Next one. So in March, the following uh, month, uh, the, the journal uh, published the risk of carotid artery stenting is, uh, compared with carotid endorectomy is greatest in patients treated within seven days of symptoms. And this is actually from a number of European trialists uh, um, uh, that we'll uh, show you in a second. It was the uh, number eight download and the number one in terms of, of uh, uh, citations. Their question was, are differences in the risk of stroke or death between carotid artery stenting and carotid endorectomy associated with time since the most recent ischemic event? The design was actually a meta-analysis of three prospective randomized single-blinded studies, uh, which uh, makes this, uh, at least up front, a relatively uh, robust way of, of doing things. It was a multi-institutional, university and non-university uh, uh, setting uh, uh, performed by interventionalists, uh, vascular surgeons, um, uh, interventional radiologists, uh, cardiologists, etc. The patients had to have been recently symptomatic with at least a 50% stenosis. And they took uh, uh, patients from the EVA3S, the endorectomy versus angioplasty, in patients with symptomatic severe carotid stenosis, the uh, ICSS, International Carotid uh, Stenting Study, and the um, SPACE, Stent Protected Angioplasty versus Carotid Endorectomy. And they, they were able to get the information on the patients, the data from all three of those studies. Now, they only analyzed those patients who received the allocated treatment, so it really was not an intention to treat analysis. And also only included those patients in whom the time interval between the qualifying event and the treatment was actually known and could be documented. And unfortunately, in the space study, that a lot of time uh, it was not recorded and that information was not available. The two interventions they compared were open carotid uh, endorectomy versus carotid artery stenting. Uh, the outcome uh, um, was basically based on a pooled analysis prospectively agreed on at the design stage of all three of these trials, 
Um, the primary outcome of interest was any stroke or death within 30 days of the treatment. The secondary outcome of interest was the disabling stroke or death or any stroke during the time of follow-up. And uh, this is just a uh, sort of a diagram of the, the patients. And so they started out overall with close to 3,500 uh, uh, patients, of which half were assigned either way. Uh, ultimately, uh, they were able to analyze uh, 1,434 on the carotid staining side and 1,405 uh, on the uh, carotid endorectomy side. And these are, these are the results as they are um, shown. And really the first thing I'd like to sort of uh, point out is that for patients undergoing carotid endorectomy, the risk of stroke or death, disabling stroke or death, or any stroke is, actually goes up as you get further away from the time of the initial event. Now those differences are not statistically significant. You can see that the 95% confidence intervals goes on either side of the line of unity there. But in any event, um, it does go up a little bit. On the other hand, if you look for carotid artery stenting, um, and all these, by the way, are indexed to the risk uh, of uh, uh, CEA done within, uh, 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 done within uh, the first week. So um, uh, in any event, you can see that the numbers seem to go down a little bit uh, in terms of the risk of stroke or death, disabling stroke or death, or any stroke as you get further away with carotid artery stenting. Um, although uh, uh, those, uh, um, those are merely trends and not statistically uh, significant. Interesting though, as you look at it, that uh, really that the, uh, the, 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 the um, difference in risk of stroke uh, between carotid endorectomy in the first column and carotid artery stenting in the second column, that difference in outcome is highest for those patients who are intervened upon within the first week. The size of the difference, and so that's uh, in terms of stroke or death, that's a, a, a relative risk of, uh, of close to four, disabling stroke or death of over six and close to four for any stroke. That, that difference in risk um, actually uh, uh, goes down at least in size in proportion uh, the longer you wait afterwards. As, as seen there. So really I think that the conclusion from this meta-analysis is that the risk of stroke or death with carotid endorectomy in symptomatic patients seems to be lowest when performed within seven days of the qualifying ischemic symptom. On the other hand, the risk of stroke or death with carotid artery stenting in symptomatic patients seems to be highest when performed within seven days of the qualifying ischemic symptom. And in fact, the increase in risk of carotid artery stenting, that increase of risk of stroke, stroke and death, compared with carotid endorectomy appears to be greatest for those patients who are treated early after, the, after their uh, uh, inciting symptom. So um, unfortunately, again, you know, just need to kind of point out some of the limitations of the study. Much of the data on timing is missing from the SPACE trial. Um, really, these patients were not randomized um, by the timing of treatment, so you know, kind of like anything else, that you, when you go mine the data that you already have collected for something else, looking for other information, um, you also introduce uh, some bias on the basis of treatment. Uh, but uh, but still, I think it's a uh, helpful information. Next day, we'll talk about came out in June uh, outcomes following infrapopetial angioplasty for critical limb ischemia uh, by uh, about a group in Boston uh, fourth in terms of number of downloads, although uh, really hadn't been around long enough to be cited uh, very often, and uh, so did not make the top 20 list. So the question they asked is, in patients with critical limb ischemia, is endovascular intervention of the infrapopetial vessels an effective therapy? The design was a retrospective, single-armed, non-blinded, non-randomized, so basically no, uh, no control group. The setting was a university vascular surgical practice. The patient's intervention, so they looked at attempted infrapopetial artery endovascular intervention for patients with critical limb ischemia uh, within the uh, outflow vessel of a, uh, uh, or stenosis within a outflow vessel of a tibial bypass. Stents were only placed for flow limiting dissections or residual stenosis of greater than 30%. So it was not mandatory steady. And this actually included, <coughs> excuse me, quite a few patients from an earlier report. 
Their outcome of interest was basically technical su success, uh, which was defined again as less than 30% residual stenosis on a single plane arteriogram. So uh, they also looked at primary patency, freedom from restenosis, freedom from reintervention, uh, which is always kind of a biased uh, um, outcome to look at, and limb salvage. Okay, so again, here's, uh, here's their numbers uh, uh, in terms of the patients they included in the group. And all I can uh, really uh, say from this is that, uh, um, as you might expect, a number of their patients uh, had a number of uh, risk factors. Uh, and uh, actually, quite a few of their patients were in the class uh, task C, class, or task uh, D group. So they weren't necessarily all uh, um, uh, real easy uh, uh, um, to perform. Interesting, and we'll, we'll address this a little bit later. By the way, uh, most of their patients, well, actually all their patients had, uh, or most of their patients had some degree of tissue loss. Um, they, in their analysis later, they discuss a, a, uh, a group called not a candidate for bypass, which made up a quarter of their patients. And either that meant, in their mind, that there was no suitable target vessel for bypass, no availability of presumably autogenous conduit. Uh, the patients were non-ambulatory otherwise. Uh, that there was a medical contraindication, uh, that there was a wound over the potential target they wanted to go to, or one patient was severely demented. Okay, so what were the numbers? So if you look at primary patency, and uh, they really uh, selected uh, the information to give us sort of based on what they found to be statistically significant, I believe, but in any event, uh, comparing uh, task A, B, and C to task D, that the primary patency, as you might imagine, uh, was worst for the task D uh, patients. Interestingly, uh, for patients who were not considered to be a candidate for bypass, uh, those patients also did worse in terms of primary patency uh, compared to the, the task A, B, and C. If you look at freedom from restenosis, they decided to sort of sort this out according to uh, uh, task uh, classification. And uh, again, as you might expect, that the, uh, the more involved the lesion, the more extensive, the more complete the occlusion, uh, the, uh, the uh, less likely it was to remain free from restenosis on follow-up uh, examination. And uh, at five years uh, for the, uh, really the uh, B, C, and D, or the, the C and D lesions, they were uh, out at about uh, only 25%. At two years, they were about 40% for the task C and D, while they were closer to 60% uh, uh, from the uh, uh, for the task A, which is uh, um, pretty comparable to uh, uh, many other studies. Freedom for reintervention. Uh, this is actually reported in terms of whether you were free from reintervention with a bypass, free from reintervention with a angioplasty, or from any type of revascularization, and. Uh, as you uh, might ex expect um, from a uh, study looking primarily at, at, uh, at uh, lesions that were initially managed endovascularly, that uh, it seemed that they tried very hard not to reintervene with bypass, but the most common reintervention, uh, the patients were more likely uh, to undergo a repeat reintervention with an angioplasty. And then freedom from repeat angioplasty. Um, if the patient was considered not a bypass candidate, uh, for whatever reason, they were less likely to, uh, to revascularize uh, those patients uh, uh, with angioplasty. I'm not entirely certain I understand how all that works, but maybe that, that particular group of patients, including the demented patient, maybe they decided that one try was enough and it wasn't worth uh, trying again. Interestingly, freedom from bypass uh, you, you, you could see that, uh, that uh, if you had initial technical success, you were less likely to uh, have to undergo a bypass. Uh, as might make sense, if you were initially considered not a bypass candidate, you were less likely to undergo bypass, although interestingly, uh, it looks like about 12% uh, of patients who were not considered bypass candidates underwent bypass anyway in follow-up. And then finally, limb salvage, again, as you might expect, uh, the TAS-D lesions, the more extensive lesions, were uh, less likely uh, to uh, have long-term uh, limb salvage, although I would say eight years that uh, overall, uh, um, it all probably averages out at about 80%, so that's actually uh, uh, not too terribly bad uh, um, either. So 
when you kind of look at things, though, in terms of wound healing at six months and, uh, and at one year, I'm afraid to say, again, a little bit disappointing is even in this group, complete heal wound healing was only achieved in 15% in, uh, overall. And even at one year, only about two-thirds had complete wound healing, although most patients, uh, about 90%, uh, were complete or improved from where they had, had been before. Also, uh, unfortunately, uh, um, although, again, you have to kind of keep in mind about the ambulatory ability of the people we start out with, uh, still only 50 to 60 percent were still able to ambulate uh, independently a year after intervention. So, so clearly this is a sick group of patients uh, with a lot of other things going on, but there are also clearly remains an awful lot of room for improvement of what we uh, give the patients. Amputation rates were not higher in association with multi-level versus single-level intervention. So just because you have more than one uh, level uh, that you have to intervene on, uh, go right, go right ahead. And that was true both at, uh, um, at one year and five years. And, uh, um, and again, as you might uh, expect, uh, a reasonable conclusion is that uh, infrapopatial endovascular revascularization is associated with better results for A, B, and C lesions compared to TAS D lesions. The risk of restenosis also appears to be related to the task category, which again is not really surprising. Uh, unfortunately, this study, obviously being uh, really a non-controlled study and all retrospective, uh, is literally limited by selection uh, bias, information bias, uh, and uh, lack of angiographic follow-up for all patients. This is the last uh, um, uh, uh, article that I'm going to uh, present to you, and uh, this is actually part two. This is the longer term. Um, follow-up uh, of a, a previously reported study, randomized clinical trial comparing endovenous laser ablation and the stripping of the great saphenous vein with clinical and duplex outcomes after five years. And in case any of you haven't really uh, picked up on it, uh, uh, Dr. Sadawi, Dr. Perler really don't like things like short-term, mid-term, long-term follow-up, so uh, you really won't see that in the title very often. It'll be uh, five-year follow-up, 30-day follow-up, et cetera. Again, this, was, uh, this is later in the year, um, but it already had uh, three citations, uh, more than uh, 20 downloads. The question they asked was, in patients with great saphenous vein incompetence, is endovenous laser ablation equivalent to high ligation and stripping with regard to duplex and clinical outcomes? The design was a prospective randomized non-blinded study. The setting was uh, from two private surgical centers in Denmark. The patients were consecutive patients with symptomatic varicose veins and documented great saphenous vein incompetence. Uh, they were uh, C2 to 4 and suitable for both treatment modalities, either open or endovascular uh, repair, and they had to be aged between 18 and 80. The exclusions were patients who had a prior deep vein thrombus, known chronic deep vein insufficiency, known per um, uh, peripheral arterial disease, or pregnant patients. The intervention was either flush ligation of the great saphenous vein at the saphenofemoral junction and stripping to just below the knee uh, with mini phlebectomy for all the uh, secondary veins and a compression for a minimum of two weeks. That was the open surgical versus use of, and they, in this case, they used a uh, uh, 980 uh, nanometer uh, 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 diode laser, bare tip fiber, pulse mode, 12 watts, and stopping within one to two centimeters of the saphenofemoral junction also with mini phlebectomies and also with two weeks of compression. Their primary outcome of interest was reflex, reflux in the great saphenous vein on duplex imaging with the patient standing. And secondary, they looked at a number of quality of life scores, uh, um, disease specific, the Aberdeen varicose vein symptom severity score and the venous clinical severity score. And then also looking at generalized quality of life, they looked at the uh, RAND SF36. And their uh, points uh, which were follow up were at baseline one, three, and five years later. And this is the late five year data. So again, this doesn't project very well, but I'll tell you they started out, they assessed 1,100 patients, they randomized 120 patients, and at the time of uh, follow-up, uh, um, at five years, however, this report uh, is, is ultimately uh, 19 patients in the uh, um, open group and uh, uh, 21 patients in the endovascular group uh, made it to the five years uh, for analysis. Although, of course, they included analysis all along the way when possible. 
Patients were relatively evenly matched in terms of their uh, disease severity and their age and their gender. Um, and if you look overall, um, you can see uh, the incidence of clinical recurrence uh, and technical failure um, overall uh, is uh, very similar, slightly higher evidence of uh, reflux on the, on the uh, endovenous uh, um, uh, group uh, compared to the open uh, uh, group with the exception of the thigh uh, perforators. And they put this into uh, NICE, uh, again, uh, Captain Meyer Curtis with us. The shaded areas are looking at the uh, standard error being at 10 percent. And although the surgical uh, looks higher there, that in fact, uh, because of the overlap, uh, that there is, uh, um, uh, that is not as significant as you might expect. But interestingly, again, uh, in terms of uh, freedom from great saphenous reflex at five years, surgical was about 90 percent and about 83% uh, uh, for uh, endovenous. If you look at from clinically significant, clinically uh, recurrent varicose veins, there really was no difference at uh, five years, uh, with about only 60% only, uh, being the case. And uh, clearly, if, if you didn't have recurrent reflux, that means that other veins became varicose. And freedom for reoperation re uh, was also essentially the same at that time period. Looking at the overall quality of uh, life scores, the disease specific, uh, the Aberdeen score, there was no difference, either initially or really at any time period. The same uh, for the VCSS score, no difference of quality of life. And uh, uh, this is the RAND score, and it's a little bit hard to read the study, but basically looking at the individual components, then at the bottom, the, uh, um, the uh, composite score, um, that there is no difference side to side while there is a statistically significant difference in improvement in both the uh, mental and the uh, uh, physical uh, uh, component uh, uh, scores, uh, improvement uh, with either therapy that was persistent to five years uh, compared to baseline. So in conclusion, five years after intervention with EVLA versus open surgical stripping for varicose veins, there were no significant differences in great saphenous vein reflux detected by duplex. Uh, also, no differences in the quality of life scores. Uh, there was no difference in clinical recurrences or the need for reoperation. Now, clearly, with only about 20 patients in each group making it all the way five years, there's clearly an opportunity for a type 2 statistical error um, that uh, there may be something there that we just don't have enough patients to know. So, that's all I was going to present. And, uh, you know, I think in terms, again, defining what are the best papers published in JVS during 2013, well, obviously, that choose the papers that support our own biases. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was very good job. I'm not surprised. I knew that you were going to do a good job, as you always do. You always present here excellent.